Its name is THC, and it was discovered back in 1964 in a lab in Jerusalem by chemist Raphael Meshulam. Cannabis had not been well investigated, which was strange. After all, it was being used illegally or illegally by millions of people, and yet we didn't know that much about it. So I thought it's a good idea to uh, look at it again from a modern point of view. In the lab, Meshulam and his colleagues broke cannabis down and zeroed in on the chemical components that might be causing its effects. We isolated about 10 compounds. Surprisingly, out of the 10 compounds we isolated, only one, which now is known as delta 9 tetrahydrocannabinol, in short THC, only one causes the well-known uh, high. We tested it in humans, many of my friends, and we saw that the compound is effective as we expected it to be. The identification of THC answered one question, but raised another. Just what did it do to the brain? I had always assumed that people knew how marijuana worked. It surprised me, actually, when I began looking in the research literature that, that it was really clear that no one really knew how it worked. In 1988, Alin Howlett found the answer. She discovered that deep inside the brain, THC molecules activate a previously unknown network of specialized chemical receptors. So that was proof that there is a receptor protein in the brain that can bind to the uh, THC like a key in a lock. It was very exciting because what that meant to us was we had a tool that could be used for studying and other researchers could use it as well. And people could study where the receptor was in the brain. Howlett and other scientists found the receptors in the hippocampus, which forms memories, the cerebellum, which controls movement, and the frontal cortex, where we think. Here were these receptors that this chemical produced by a plant out in the world just so happened to have the precise combination to unlock. What an extraordinary thing that is. Um, is that why that receptor network existed, so that people could get high? We don't have those receptors just so that people can get high smoking pot. Receptors are developed in neurons so that they can communicate with a chemical that the body makes. So that was the logic behind going in and trying to extract a compound in the brain that would act just like marijuana did. And in 1992, proof came that the brain does make a compound very much like THC. It was discovered by none other than Raphael Meshulam, who named it anandamide. We call it the brain's own marijuana because the compound that is made by the brain, anandamide, shares all the properties in terms of at the receptor level and cellular level that uh, THC has. It turns out that when anandamide is released in the brain, like marijuana, it affects such basic things as appetite, pain, and memory. And it plays a critical role in a sometimes underappreciated mental function, forgetting. When I first heard that, it didn't seem adaptive to me to have a drug for forgetting. Memory, we understand, has great survival utility. You, you, you know, you learn that that's a poisonous mushroom or that's a dangerous animal and you stay away and you remember that. But why would forgetting be adaptive? And I asked Michelin this question and he said, well, tell me, do you really want to remember all the faces you saw on the subway this morning? Forgetting well is almost as important as remembering well. Forgetting is about editing. It's about taking the flood, the ocean of sense information coming at you and forgetting everything but what's important. So life is not just about accumulating new memories. Memory can cripple us, too. Get out! Get out! You have soldiers returning from war zones that are traumatized by experiences that, in effect, they can't unlearn. So if you could help them unlearn that, essentially a productive kind of forgetting, 
either with a drug or um, some other kind of regime, that would be incredibly useful.